Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the final installment of my Cannes Film Festival. I switched around things this morning, and you know I've been lamenting the fact that I've been stuck at the IMAX theater. Well, I canceled one of my tickets and I rebooked it for the actual Grand Theater Lumiere screening of the film after all of this time just stuck over on the other side of the city to walk up the Lumiere Theater steps. Oh, so exciting. All right, it is now three days later from that last recording. A lot has happened, so I'm going to talk through all of the movies that I've seen in the past few days. This is my final day at the film festival, so I still have two movies to watch. I'll talk about those a bit later, but I've got plenty of films to get through before then. But here's the reason why I have not uh, talked about the movies that I saw earlier yet, and it's because as I was about to record, for the, uh, the day that you just saw clips of. As I was about to record for that, I was heading home. So I'm waiting at a train station and these two teenagers come up to me and punch me in the face. So I don't have a bruise here, uh, but they just walked up to me, wound up and just rocked my shit and then put me in a chokehold headlock. Uh, and then walked away. They didn't take anything. <laughs> they hit me one time, chokehold and gone absolutely shocked. I, I didn't do anything to provoke this. I'll, I'll just say that off the bat. Completely random act, but I'm just glad that they didn't do more, that it wasn't a full mugging. This happened on the only day that I've brought my laptop to the festival. I've left my laptop home every other day. The one day I bring it, I get attacked. <laughs> but they didn't take it, so that's all good. I'm okay. Still a little bit rattled from it. Probably gonna start taking self-defense classes when I go home, <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, okay. So the first film that I saw was Grand Tour, the new Miguel Gomez film. Grand Tour follows a man who, after getting cold feet, he decides to start running away, going on a tour from place to place in Asia at the turn of the 20th century. But his fiance is not willing to roll over and accept the loss of her husband-to-be, so she follows after him, hot on his trail the entire time as he goes from place to place, country to country throughout Asia. But the story's less of the thing that's really interesting about this film. The techniques behind the film are what makes this a very interesting piece of art. Because Grand Tour was actually filmed as a mixture of documentary and fiction. Actually, starting in 2019, going to 2022, the filmmaker hired a team of local filmmakers in all of these different places to go and film the areas, to go and capture culture and art and life and food. And so filming of documentary footage went from 2019 to 2022. And in 2022, Miguel Gomez, the filmmaker, assembled a cut of the documentary and then wrote a story into it to be shot in studios entirely. And so the film blends modern day documentary footage alongside these beautifully designed scenes shot inside studio spaces telling the story. And effectively what I believe the film is doing is it's decolonializing the image which is typically othered or orientalized through film. Normally these travelogue type films that we see, especially ones from around the time period this is set in, the early 1900s to the 1920s, 1930s. These films had a colonial gaze. The idea of these movies going to new exotic places around the world was to give Western viewers an idea of what life was like in these so-called exotic places. And so a lot of the time, these films would go a little bit far in stretching the reality. They would blend the documentary footage with narrative, but they wouldn't tell anyone in a little bit of a disingenuous way. So for example, a film like Nanook of the North, which is known as starting the entire documentary genre, a good chunk of that is fake. It's staged to exoticize a culture to make Western viewers go, 
oh my god, I didn't know they did that. And so Grand Tour is making a commentary on this type of filmmaking, specifically by having the documentary footage not shot by Miguel Gomez whatsoever, but instead a crew of Asian filmmakers. It flips the colonial gaze on its head. And so there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here, especially because while the narrative story is set entirely in the past, the documentary footage is very obviously in the present. In some clips, we see people that have phones, and then we go back and it's this classic story that feels like something David Lean would have made, like Lawrence of Arabia or A Passage to India. Ultimately, I'm gonna need another watch of this one to let the themes really sink in with me. At times, I didn't find that the story, the narrative, the characters really engaged me, even though I really appreciated the themes and I liked the filmmaking style that was being employed here. This one still didn't quite have enough to do it for me, really. And after that, I saw Motel Destino, the new Karim Ainu's film, a Brazilian film about a sex motel. It tells the story of a young man who, after staying overnight in a sex hotel, he accidentally oversleeps and misses a very important job that he was supposed to do, which ends up leading to the death of his brother. And because of this, he ends up having to go into hiding. Where else does he choose to hide but the sex hotel? And he takes on a job as the handyman around the place. The motel is run by a couple, and he quickly forms a very close, maybe a little bit too close, bond with the wife of this couple, leading to an illicit affair. Although the erratic, violent nature of the husband becomes more and more worrying as the film goes on. This film entertained me a lot. I found it to be a compelling thriller with a unique setting. I've never seen a film take place in a location like this, and so it's always refreshing to see a film that comes in with new ideas of settings to tell stories in. And the filmmaking is sharp and exciting and energetic. Every image is drenched in neon lights, purple, pink, blue. This film is just soaked in color. This is maybe one of the hardest NC-17 films that I've ever seen. There's a lot of sex. Every single scene seems to be a sex scene, because if it's not happening on camera, we're hearing it happening off camera in a nearby room. It's not perfect. At times it takes a little bit of the easy way out, gets a little bit cheesy, but I enjoyed this one for the most part. Then I saw Flow, an animated film from the Uncertain Regard category. This is a children's animated film, and we follow a little baby kitten, the smallest little bean of a cat, who, while escaping from the rising waters, ends up on a boat, sharing the boat with a golden retriever, a gopher, a bird, and a lemur. Animals as main characters is a function of animated films that we have seen for years and years now. Kids love animals, but always when we see animals on screen in animated films, they're anthropomorphized. They're talking, they're cracking jokes, they have the voice of whatever stand-up comedian is hot right now. But with Flo, instead of taking the typical approach that we might see in a DreamWorks film or in an Illumination film, these characters don't talk. They are just animals. The cat acts like a cat. Uncanny Cannily so. There were times watching this cat's mannerisms where I couldn't stop seeing my cats on screen. The dog acts like a dog. The bird acts like a bird. They don't need to say anything. Their character comes from the natural animal traits that they have. In this extreme situation, we see these animals in sort of a reverse life of pie situation, trying to survive as they're stranded at sea, losing more and more land. And for being a film that has no dialogue, where the characters are animals exclusively acting exactly like animals, I was really impressed by how the film still manages to show you character motivations, even though the motivations are completely unhuman. They're not wanting or striving for things in a way that humans would. They're animals. The cat wants what the cat wants. And the animation quality in this is gorgeous. It has this beautifully textured look that looks less like other animated films, and maybe a little bit more like something you'd see in an independent video game. It reminded me a little bit of video games like Hollow Knight, where it just drops you into a world, doesn't tell you anything about it, and it's up to you if you want to uncover the lore of it, if you want to uncover what all of these beautiful things actually mean. Another thing I appreciated about Flow is that although it is very much a children's movie, it's also now
never afraid to be intense. It's never afraid to genuinely make you concerned for these animals' safety and well-being. Some of the scenes are shocking and frightening, with water rushing through and sweeping the animals away. There were times when I gasped, when I was ooing and aahing with the movie. Now this does create a challenge because the film might feel a little bit too kitty to be marketed to adults, but it's going to be a little bit too scary, a little bit too intense to be marketed to children. And so I worry a little bit that this film is going to struggle to find an audience, even though it very much deserves it. This could be a potential animated contender later in the year. If you like cats, you've never seen a cuter movie cat than this one. And that moves us to the next day. In between here, that's where I got punched in the face. Anyways, here's the next day. Um. <laughs> Hi, hello, what's up? Uh, <laughs> come in, come in, please. The next film that I saw was Anora by Sean Baker. And although I didn't get to see the premiere of this one, I was quite late seeing this movie, seeing the last screening possible of it. I did go to the red carpet, and here is a video. <laughs> Sean Baker, son réalisateur, il est entouré par ses comédiennes, Mickey Madison, l'équipe d'Adora va maintenant rejoindre le Grand Théâtre Lumière. It's the only red carpet that I've had a chance to see so far, so it was really cool just to see them walk up to the steps. But anyways, let's talk about the movie. Anora is the latest film by Sean Baker, director of The Florida Project, Red Rocket, Tangerine, Starlet. And this film follows the story of a stripper and sex worker in Brooklyn, who after meeting a whale one night at the club, after being set up because she was the only stripper at the club that could speak Russian, she ends up in a bit of a Cinderella story, where this wealthy Russian kid wants to take her her around to all of these different locations and have her be his personal girlfriend for the next few weeks. And it turns out that this wealthy, big spender Russian kid is actually the son of a Russian oligarch. So he has essentially unlimited money and Anora, the main character, who goes by Annie, starts to feel quite charmed by the guy. He's giving her everything she could ever want, and she's having a great time. So when the two are in Vegas and he proposes to her, she enthusiastically says yes and sees it as her ticket to everything she's ever wanted in the world. But when news of their wedding reaches Russia and gets to his parents, all hell breaks loose, and his parents try to get the marriage annulled at all costs. This is by far one of the best films I've seen at the Cannes Film Festival, and though The Florida Project still has a special place in my heart, still remains my favorite of Sean Baker's films, it is without a doubt that I say, Anora is the best thing Sean Baker has ever made. The film combines elements of Sean Baker's filmography that he's been working on for over 20 years now. The working class solidarity and the understanding that the American dream is largely a lie propagated to make people feel like upwards mobility is possible when really the class you're born into is sort of the class that you're going to be stuck in. As the character of Honora begins to feel like she has found a way out, she's found a way to move upwards, to move out of the working life that she has always been hustling for. And so the film takes this premise and it just breaks your heart with it. It makes you feel every moment this hopefulness, this feeling that something's going to work out right for her. And it holds that right up against you before ripping it away and showing that really it was all just a fairy tale. And it combines this deeply mature emotional storytelling with Sean Baker's classic comedy. This film is funny as hell. The performances from Mikey Madison and Yuri Borisov are phenomenal. Madison in particular has this being a hustler, being a hard worker who strives for everything and stops at nothing. And yet through that we can see that she's someone who just wants to rest, she wants to enjoy her life, she wants to sit back and relax for once because she's never been able to do that. And so there's these layers to her performance, these hidden emotions and desires that she doesn't let the world see, but we can see through the cracks. Anora absolutely blew me away. This is one of the best films of the year, and like I said, I think 
think this is the best film of Sean Baker's career, even if it's still not quite my favorite one behind The Florida Project. But this is very deserving of all the praise it's getting, and I just know when people get to see this one, it's going to become one of the most talked about films of the year on film Twitter, on Letterboxd. People are going to obsess over this movie. The next film I saw was Beating Hearts, otherwise known as L'Amour Ouf, the new film by Jill Lelouch. This is a big budget, romantic comedy, kind of musical, ultra-violent crime thriller. It says that it's a lot of things, but it delivers on very few of those promises. This tells the story of two high school sweethearts, one being a, a bit of a troublemaker boy who gets into fights, who steals, and he ends up falling in love with one of the goody two-shoes nerdy girls at the school, and the two of them have this sort of opposite attract thing. But when he joins the local mafia, he ends up getting caught and sentenced to 10 years in jail for a murder he did not commit. After being released from jail, he goes and tracks down his high school love, only to find that she is now married to someone else. And though their romance may end up working, the film didn't work whatsoever for me. I'm a big musical guy, I like big swings, and to me, it's all style, it's all flair, but there's nothing below the surface. The romance is this very shallow, what if uh, a girl got back with her toxic high school boyfriend and they were actually really in love with each other the whole time. And then the crime elements of the film just feel like a pale imitation of Martin Scorsese or Guy Ritchie doing much better movies. So while there might be a lot of money on screen, there's not a lot of ideas on screen that we haven't seen before. And I mentioned earlier there's some musical elements. They never sing, but they do dance quite quite a bit, but the dance sequences are just thrown in haphazardly. There's no real intent or thought behind how these dance sequences are playing into the film. They're just kind of there. Also, the film is three hours long, and it does not necessitate that runtime whatsoever. By the end of the film, even though it was three hours long, when the credits rolled, I just sat there going, wait, that was the story? That's how they ended it? That's what they're going with? This was a massive misfire for me, and one of the biggest disappointments at the festival so far. <laughs> लास्ट टाइम कभी फोन किया था उसने एक साल से ऊपर हो गए the next film that I saw was All We Imagine as Light, the new film by Payal Kapadia, and the first film from India to play in the Cannes competition in 30 years. All We Imagine as Light tells the story of two nurses in Mumbai who are both repressed in different ways. One of them is married to a man who left the country without a word to go and work in Germany, and the other one is in a new relationship with a Muslim man who her family does not approve of. And so both of these women have desires that they are not allowed to manifest. This city, this society does not allow for that. As these women are forced into little boxes of what is expected of them, of what should be of them, the film really goes after traditions of arranged marriage, as well as critiquing the women's role in Indian society and within Mumbai. Every scene in Mumbai zones in on female workers, showing their determination, their spirit, and how they're doing all of the jobs that the men do not want to do. And yet, despite that, we also see through the film that these women are not appreciated, that they're not respected, and that although they are the pillar that makes Mumbai stand up, it also critiques the fact that they're still treated as second-class citizens in this society. Oftentimes in storytelling, we get these stories about people who are repressed by their rural upbringing, who need to run away and escape to the big city in order to make their dreams happen. But all we imagine is light kind of takes the opposite approach, where instead the city itself is the repressing force. Mumbai forces these women into a box, doesn't allow them to be who they want to be, to love who they want. It puts a barrier up that doesn't allow for these women to find self-determination. And in fact, they need to run away to the countryside, to a rural space, to find the freedom, to find the enlightenment that they need, to be allowed to express their individuality and be the people that they want to be. It's an interesting subversion of this road trip vacation formula in which the rural space becomes somewhere that represents more freedom. And Payal Kapadia's filmmaking is warm and sweet and soft, with moments lingering in a beautiful way, and poetic lines of dialogue interspersed throughout. The images are warm and glowing and gorgeous, with a soundtrack of smooth, soft, 
jazz piano music. The film has this magical tone to it, and although the story may never dip into magical realism, at times it feels like it is that type of movie just because of the tone of the filmmaking. Like many other films at the festival, the narrative is really unimportant here compared to the themes, compared to the filmmaking, compared to the character development. There's so much going on here that's so much deeper than the story itself. This feels less like a film that just premiered and more like a classic that we should have been discussing for generations at this point. In fact, I'd be willing to say that I think in 2032, if one film from this year ends up on the sight and sound list, it'll be this one. This feels like an important work from a filmmaker who might go on to define a new wave of Indian cinema. This is one of my new art house darlings. I can't wait to watch it again and dive in even deeper to some of the themes, especially when I'm not 31 movies deep into a film festival, because I will admit I did doze once or twice throughout the movie. It's just what happens when you're exhausted from film festival life, but I'm anxiously awaiting getting to see the film again. <laughs> And the final film I saw yesterday was The Village Next to Paradise. This is a film from Somalia, and it tells the story of a rural community called Paradise, where a man, his son, and his sister live together, and he drives a truck transporting illicit goods under the guise of being just a truck transporting livestock. Meanwhile, his sister wants to open up her own tailoring shop and his son is forced to go to boarding school. The plot is quite thin in The Village Next to Paradise. Again, it's not a movie that's about plot. A lot of these movies have not been about the plot. They've been about the atmosphere, the tone, and that's what this movie's going for. It is durational cinema. Every scene, every shot is stretched out beyond imagination. This is a 40 minute movie stretched into a two hour, 10 minute movie where every line of dialogue is punctuated by a 30 second silence where they just sit there and we just have to sit there with them and contemplate. And this is not the best type of movie to be watching 32 movies into a festival. Sitting in silence with the characters was a test of patience, a test of endurance at this point in the festival. Would it be easier to watch if I was a little bit earlier in? Sure. Would I find it that much more interesting than I did this time? I don't think so. There wasn't really a lot in the themes or the characters that hooked me all that much. I like a good chunk of films that are like this, that operate with this durational tone. Some of my favorite movies are Satan Tango, which is seven hours, largely of people sitting in silence, or A Brighter Summer Day, four and a half hours, another film where it's just silence, and the moments between the moments. So I do like this type of cinema often, but it needs to be presenting really strong images, as well as really strong character and themes, and this just wasn't doing that. So to me, this was more of a test of my patience than it was a really interesting film. But that said, I did really enjoy learning a little bit more about Somalia, seeing a little bit more of Somalian culture. I don't know if I've ever seen another Somalian film. So this was a really fascinating look into life on the margins uh, in another society. But unless you're really into this type of movie, I wouldn't recommend tracking this one down. All right, now with all that said, this is my final day now. I am about to go see The Seed of the Sacred Fig, which I believe is going to win the Palme d'Or in just a few hours. After that, I see The Most Precious of Cargoes, and then later today, I am going to go and hang out by the red carpet and watch all the people come back for the awards ceremony. So I cannot wait, and I will talk to you soon. So I just saw the seed of the sacred fig, and what else can I say than this is a stone cold masterpiece. The Seed of the Sacred Fig is an Iranian film directed by Mohammad Rasulov. Rasulov, who just two weeks ago fled Iran, potentially for good, as this film touches on themes and topics that are so anti-establishment, so anti-government, and so in support of the women's rights protesters, of the women life freedom movement, that upon the 
announcement of this film, he was sentenced to eight years in prison under flogging and torture. But rather than being imprisoned, he escaped the country and is now here for the Cannes Film Festival. And the film is just as revolutionary and incendiary as you would expect. This is truly important political cinema. It's the type of movie that feels like it perfectly captures a moment in time in a specific place. The same way that I felt about 20 Days in Mariupol last year where I said this is less of a film than it is a historical document. That's also how I feel about this one. I think when people look back at these protests, this is the film that they are going to go to. The Seat of the Sacred Fig tells the story of a judge of the Revolutionary Court of Iran and his family. As this man has only just been promoted to his position as a judge, he's just been assigned a handgun, uh, and since the protests are just starting up at the beginning of the film, he is working overtime sentencing hundreds of people to death every day. But things start to go awry when one day his gun is nowhere to be seen, and immediately he begins to suspect his family. What starts off as a domestic drama about patriarchy in the home very quickly becomes a tense powder keg of a thriller where it feels like things can blow up at any point in time. At three hours runtime, the film just flies by as it keeps a brisk pace that I could feel kept the entire theater breathless near the end. When the film finished and the credits rolled, there was an audible sigh of relief, a gasp from the entire crowd. This is a genuinely monumental film for the reasons I've said historically, where I think this is going to be seen as an incredibly important piece of work, but also as a movie, it stands on its own merits. The performances are all exceptional. It's impossible to pick a standout, although at different times in the film I would say different people stand out. The first half of the film I'd say the oldest daughter would be my standout, but the second half is probably the younger daughter that really rules the screen. And thematically this script is beautifully crafted. Even down to the title of the film, The Seed of the Sacred Fig. The sacred fig is a tree that acts in a parasitic manner to other trees. A sacred fig tree will start to sprout on the branches of another tree, growing roots that eventually will suffocate the other tree. And in that way, ideas and thoughts and new political opinions are like a seed of a sacred fig tree to a country's dying establishment. The smallest shreds of ideas will grow and grow and take root and eventually topple and take down the existing rule of law, the existing hierarchy. And so each of these women in this family is in their own way a seed of a sacred fig tree, waiting to take down this patriarchal regime. It's also incredibly smart how the film uses this one family unit as a microcosm for what is happening in Iran at the moment. There is of course a powerful father figure here who runs the house, but as the daughters grow and as they begin to see things with their own eyes, hear things with their own ears, their opinions begin to change. They begin to grow away from this patriarchal ideal established by their father. But of course, in a family like this, it's not just as easy as saying, we're going our own way, we want to think our own way. Instead, it needs to be fought for, and that's exactly what happens here. Every moment is a fight. Revolution is not something that can be done nicely. It's a trial by fire. It's dangerous. And that's baked into every aspect of the film. Also, very interestingly, rather than recreating any of the protests, they use archive footage in a vertical format, filmed with phones. And so this punctuates the whole film, which always keeps us in the context of how this fits into our world today. I really think this is going to be one of the biggest films of the year. It is genuinely incredible, both as an accomplishment in art, an accomplishment in protest, and just as a film on its own. It's a great piece of entertainment, even removed from all the political context. Okay, I just saw the most precious of cargoes, which I'll just get this right out of the way, I believe to be the worst film at the film festival. Unfortunately, it was also my last film of the film festival. What a way to go out. I ended with The Seed of the Sacred Fig and then the complete opposite. The most precious of cargoes. This is the new Michelle Hazanavicius film, and it tells the story of a poor couple in Poland who randomly come into possession of a baby who is thrown from a train heading to a concentration camp. The film's told in the form of a fairy tale, with a goofy, sarcastic narrator kind of leading us through this fable-esque tale. But there's not much going on here. There's not much conflict. There's not much the characters want 
or strive for. It's just a series of images loosely about the Holocaust that ends up meaning nothing in the end. It's a quick 80 minutes and some of the music is quite nice, but this is just unsubstantial, it's oversimplified, and frankly, it's just so cheesy. This is one of the worst films I've ever seen in the competition at the Cannes Film Festival, unfortunately. So, uh, not a great way to end, but at least it was not two and a half hours long. Anyways, I am back in the main village and I'm heading right over to the Palais. I'm gonna try and catch some of the red carpet for the awards ceremony. <laughs> I'm here right by the red carpet, ready to see the start of this. Who's gonna show up? Who's gonna win in these awards? All right, it is after the Cannes Film Festival. I am here sitting by the water, so excuse the wave sounds. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about my festival experience before I head home. I gotta say the last 10 days at the Cannes Film Festival have been a fantastic time. It's been a lot of fun being here, seeing great films, enjoying beautiful weather and beautiful views. But as someone who's been going to TIFF for 12 years now, my favorite festival remains TIFF. While there's obviously nothing to complain about with the weather, the views, I think the thing that keeps TIFF on top for me is that at its heart, the Cannes Film Festival is a business conference, less than it is a festival. This is not a public festival. The people that are coming to this festival are working in the industry. Sure, there are some cinephiles here, there are some people who just love movies, but you have to be approved for a pass, and it's very selective. So the majority of people here, like me, work in the industry, or are critics, or press and so generally there is this vibe of everyone is here to work whereas at a festival like TIFF for example everyone's just here to enjoy the movies you know when you go to the Toronto Film Festival the most fun times you have are the public screenings when you're there with just audience members who are excited to see something new to see the celebrities to have an experience and it can I don't feel like that is as much of a thing I mean to be fair I didn't get to go to any premiere Years, but the vibe I get is this very traditional sterile atmosphere where even when people are there to celebrate They're there to celebrate in style TIFF has press and industry screenings Those are screenings exclusively for the industry crowd the critics the filmmakers where you can go and experience the films But you don't get that same buzz of energy and that's what I felt about literally every single screening that I saw at the Cannes Film Festival They were press and industry screenings. There wasn't this atmosphere of enthusiasm. It was like all right on to the next one, it's time to work. And furthermore from that, uh, there was a major problem with people on their phones at this festival. I'm talking at at least 50% of the screenings I attended, people were on their phones the entire time. Some screenings, there were people texting and taking calls just two seats away from me. And not once did I see festival staff step in to say, you can't do that, please get off your phone. It was up to the audience. And frankly, I wasn't up for the fight most of the time. The few times when I did say something, or when I've witnessed other people saying something, the response is always, can't you see I'm working right now? Okay, but if you're working, leave the theater. And I've seen this attitude at TIFF too in the press and industry screenings, where people think because they're technically at work that the rules of a, a cinema don't apply to them anymore. And so this is a major problem overall at Cannes. The phone attitude was absolutely terrible. And I also have to say the ticketing system here is a big problem. It's incredibly frustrating getting on to the site at 
at 7 a.m. every day and having every ticket already be gone, except for the IMAX theater, which feels so disconnected from the main festival atmosphere. I found this theater to not feel like a festival at all, but just to feel like I was at the multiplex watching movies. But to be near the main festival, you have to risk not getting tickets. You have to risk standing in rush lines, refreshing your ticketing page over and over and over through the day, hoping that someone returns a ticket. And so the ticketing system is pretty broken because as soon as you book a ticket to something else, you can no longer see what tickets are available and what tickets are gone. So that means if I book a safety 3 o'clock p.m. IMAX ticket, but I want to get a 2.30 p.m. ticket, I can't see if that ticket comes available unless I don't have anything else at that time. So there's no such thing as a plan B here. You can't do a plan B. You have to just have your plan A. And I find that to be incredibly frustrating, especially because my goal was to see as many movies as possible. Now, this is my fault. Uh, and the next time I come to the festival, I'm going to be less strict on myself about seeing every single movie. I'm going to have a little bit more flexibility and not need to attend every single competition title. So next time I'm going to take more risks. I'm going to wait on tickets. I'm going to do rush lines. I'm going to experience the main festival more. And I'm not going to go to this goddamn IMAX theater that made me feel so disconnected from the festival. And keep in mind, this IMAX theater is a 30 to 40 minute bus ride away from the main festival area. Although it's only a one hour walk. So it's ridiculous to me that an area can be only twice the speed to bus somewhere as it is to walk. You know, if I had jogged there, I feel like I would get faster than on a bus, especially because the buses only come once every 15 minutes if you're lucky. But again, everyone is gonna have a different experience here. I chalk a lot of this up to the way that I planned out my festival. Next time I'm here, I plan to plan a lot less. There are so many things that I didn't do at the Cannes Film Festival this year. And though I enjoyed my experience a lot, I know it could be so much better and I'm determined for it to be so much better next time. Because while this time I saw a ton of great movies, I don't feel like I felt the film festival. This is not going to be the last time I'm here. I don't know if it'll be next year or the year after, but I will be here again. And next time I am going to experience the festival and not just the movies. And that is my promise to myself. But that is the end of my Cannes Film Festival. Thank you so much for tuning in to all of our Cannes Film Festival coverage. It has been an honor being able to talk about this film festival and share it with you all on this channel. As always, thank you so much for watching. My name is Matt, and this has been Fantasy Film Ball.